the Autism Research Institute relies on the generosity of donors like you to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you. Thank you. I'm always glad to speak at these conferences. And um, I spend most of my day doing the biomedical things that you've been going to be learning about in these next couple of days, the functional medicine, the diet, nutrition, and supplements. But I haven't given up my traditional developmental pediatric training. And that's equally important to what you're going to be learning about the biochemistry. And the way I think about it is the biochemical part is treatment of your child from the inside out but you also have to remember that you need good services from the outside in. So we're gonna talk about some of those um, therapies and how to get the best bang for your buck out of those therapies and not miss the external things that are equally important for your kids. Um, just before I talk, how many here are parents of kids? Okay. How many are um, either professionals or also parents and professionals taking care of kids? Okay, hopefully this will be helpful no matter where you're coming from. Um, I will say, even though the title is Diagnosis, I'm not going to spend lots and lots of time about diagnosis, because I assume if you're here, you know about the diagnosis of autism. I do need to spend some time talking about it, because you may know that the diagnosis is going to change, the criteria are going to change next year, and I want to talk sort of about my opinion about that. But hopefully, other than that, we'll be talking a lot of more practical things. Okay, so my, my goal really, the subtitle of this talk should be what a developmental pediatrician wishes every parent knew. Because I want you to be able to be better advocates when you take your child in for service. So really to try to talk about what are the right questions to ask about the medical workup, about therapies, about testing, about when you should get reevaluated, and really reviewing things that get missed. Because one of my pet peeves is that one of the downsides of an autism diagnosis is everything in your child's life then becomes, it's just his autism. Right? And sometimes it's not just autism. So we'll talk about in the medical workup, what are the clues that indicate your child needs more testing? About the therapies, what does it mean to get the right therapies? If your child's being tested, when do you test? When do you retest? And also, if you have to be your own case manager, how do you organize and coordinate the treatments if you don't have someone helping you and guiding you? So just to review the things that you're familiar with already, the current um, autism diagnosis, for whatever reason, is in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, fourth edition of the American Psychiatric Association. Now, why it ever was in a psychiatric diagnosis in this day and age and why the revisions are still in the psychiatric association's purview, I'm not sure, but that's where it is. Um, so right now, there are three main areas of uh, dysfunction in autism, qualitative impairments in social interaction, in communication, and also restricted and repetitive behaviors. So we'll just kind of quickly run through the current criteria, and then we'll spend a little more time on what the proposed new criteria are. So in terms of um, social interaction, you can either be delayed in a skill or just be quali have a qualitative difference in the skill. So one of the uh, social criteria is marked impairment in the use of multiple nonverbal behaviors. So that's the things like not making good eye contact, not reading uh, facial expressions well, not understanding body language, not using gestures such as waving and pointing, which are all fairly early and important skills. You know, when you point to something at nine months, big people run across the room and bring you things. It's a very powerful social skill that for whatever reason, autistic kids don't naturally develop. There's a failure to develop peer relationships appropriate to that child's developmental level, not chronologic age. And a lack of spontaneous, share, spontaneous seeking to share enjoyment, interest, or achievements with others. So it's about does your child bring you an object or a toy to share the experience of it, not just to have you open it or fix it, but to have uh, an experience sharing that, that toy. And there's also a lack of that social or emotional reciprocity, that normal back and forth of social engagement. Uh, the second category is impairments in communication that can range from completely being nonverbal to having uh, sort of more atypical qualities to your spoken language. So that can include things like not being able to have a conversation. You can have perfectly good language, but not be able to answer questions or carry on a back and forth conversation. There can be stereotyped or repetitive language, the things you're familiar with, the immediate echolalia, repeating things or scripting from videos. Um, and there can be a lack of spontaneous or imaginative play. 
And then the third category is the sort of more physically obvious things, the restricted or repetitive uh, behaviors or routines that are not functional. So it can be things like being very um, preoccupied with a topic that is either unusual or is more intense than expected. So, for example, I had a 10-year-old boy whose fascination was, you know, shopping malls, and he could tell me every single store in every shopping mall within a five-mile radius of my office. Well, that's unusual for a 10-year-old boy, and it's also more intense to know all those details. Um, to have inflexible um, adherence to routines, like lining things up, collecting things, hoarding things, carrying things around with you. The more obvious physical things, stereotyped motor mannerisms like uh, hand flapping, finger flicking, toe walking, or being persistently preoccupied with parts of objects. So instead of playing with a car, spinning its wheels. Some of you may have kids, if they see a stroller, the first thing they want to do is flip it over so that they can play with the wheels on the stroller. So it can be a fairly intense need. Um, also, the delays have to come in before age three in these areas. And for me, when I'm thinking about diagnostics, must not be better explained by something else. So not everything that looks like autism is autism. So you always have to take these little lists of criteria with a grain of salt and, and never forget to keep thinking about the kids. So there's going to be a new revision that's been in process all year, but the time for feedback about them is done. And so these are probably going to become real in May of 2013 which is the now the fifth edition, the DSM-5 criteria. Um, they've now divided it into four different sections, and the sort of controversial part is in the first part, you have to meet all the criteria in this first part, whereas the old diagnosis, you could kind of mix and match symptoms from each of the areas. You now have to have all three symptoms in a now new combined criteria, which is they combine the social um, requirement with the language requirement, which I think has some benefits to it, but the potential downside is that you have to have all three symptoms, so you can't just have two out of the three. So you have to have problems in this social emotion re reciprocity, which includes things like conversation. Joint attention means sort of sharing uh, the joy of an experience with somebody else. To have deficits in your nonverbal communication, which includes eye contact, body language, facial expression, and gestures and also trouble maintaining relationships. And that includes things like play, includes making friends that previously were separated out into these are social issues, these are language issues. The second area is also still the restricted and repetitive behaviors. And you have to have at least two of these, uh, the more uh, repetitive motor movements or unusual use of objects, um, the unusual routines or resistance to change the highly restricted and fixated interests. And then a good thing I think they added for the very first time is sensory. So they've now got included in the diagnosis something that many of the kids have, which is either an over or under reactivity to sensory input or an unusual interest in certain aspects of the environment, needing deep pressure, needing movement, needing jumping. I wish they'd gone a step further and created a whole separate diagnosis called sensory processing disorder, because most of you know your kids have that disorder need occupational therapy and you cannot code it for insurance reasons as sensory processing because there's no diagnostic category. So I was really hopeful when I saw this added to the autism diagnosis that they would take it a step and in this uh, revision make a sensory processing diagnosis, but they didn't. So that's still a challenge. Um, the other new thing they put in, which I think is helpful, is that symptoms must be present in early childhood, which is similar to the old criteria but they put a caveat in that the symptoms may not be fully manifest until the social demands exceed your capacities. So many of you may have kids who wasn't really clear they had autism when they were two or three and then they went to preschool. And it became really obvious that they were different than the other kids. So this is acknowledging that you might have a kid who's milder and you didn't realize they had the diagnosis until they became more obviously different and they didn't have enough cognitive abilities or other things to override the social deficit. And then with any of these lists of symptoms, the symptoms have to be uh, taken together impairing to your life in some way. So not every symptom is pathology if you're functioning well. They also now include sort of three levels of severity. So mild, moderate, and severe, basically your child requires support, substantial report, support, or very substantial support. Um, and their rationale for changing the criteria, uh, which 
they've now done is they're going to change it to autism spectrum disorders and they're going to eliminate the words PDD or pervasive developmental disorder and the mo most controversial part is that we'll eliminate Asperger's as a separate diagnosis which I think is a big problem. Um, their rationale for this was that um, since autism is defined by a common set of behaviors it's best to give it a single diagnostic category and then adapt it depending on the individual symptoms whether they're mild, whether they're moderate, whether they're severe um, rather than having so many combinations of how you can reach the diagnosis. Um, I think that they're um, making the three domains into two is probably a good logical thing because it's really hard to have a separate category of social versus language because there's so much overlap. Um, you know, is eye contact, eye contact is currently listed as a social issue. But eye contact is communication, right? So how do you know which category to put it in? So now they've combined it which I think makes clinical sense. Um, they also say that delays in language are not universal. It's not diagnostic of autism. It influences the symptoms, but it's not diagnostic. And they also say that in DSM-4, there's just too many criteria that can fall in too many categories and so that you don't have as good diagnostic clarity. And I think those things are true. So there are benefits. I think probably diagnosis will get more accurate in some ways. Um, again, I think combining those overlapping symptoms into one category makes sense. Um, I like that they allow for the milder ch children that the symptoms might show up later. I think it's helpful to have a severity range, but I think there are a lot of concerns that come from this change. Um, I do think that not having Asperger's separated out is a problem. Even though there's overlapping symptoms, I think clinically people with Asperger's look different, have different therapy needs, have different social needs, and I think, and they tend to be milder in terms of these new criteria, and I'm really afraid that a lot of uh, kids who have Asperger's diagnosis won't have a diagnosis with the new criteria, which has implications for therapy and supports and coverage. Um, I think for some of the kids it's going to be too restrictive that you have to have all three of the social and language criteria. I think that's where some kids are going to fall out of meeting criteria for the diagnosis. And then the big concern that all the communities who are looking at autism is that is this going to result in loss of diagnosis for some kids, which then will result in loss of services. And that could be school ther services, getting your insurance to pay for private therapies, if you're in the military and you have TRICARE, one of the bonuses of that is that you get amazing coverage for ABA, up to $3,000 a month. Well, what if you no longer have the diagnosis? So I think that's people's legitimate fear about what's going to happen if you lose your diagnosis. Because what's, your child isn't changing, what people are calling your child is changing, so the needs are exactly the same, just the label is changing. Right? Um, there are studies and people looking at this or the people who wrote the criteria claim that the diagnosis would be more specific without losing sensitivity, which is the ability to not miss kids with the diagnosis. And just from a common sense perspective, I'm not sure, <clears throat> in spite of some of the studies that are coming out, how that's really going to play out in real life, how kids are not going to lose their diagnosis. So there have been some, uh, they did what was called field testing, which is how they tried to figure out the criteria, and they tested out these criteria in certain settings, and they said that there won't be any change in the number of patients receiving care for autism in treatment centers, and I think that's an important uh, point, um, because kids who go to treatment centers may be kids who are more severe, and they're the kids who are not going to lose their diagnosis. Um, Autism Speaks in May said they looked at a field trial of 300 children seen at pediatric autism clinics and they felt the majority of the folks retained their diagnoses in the new criteria. Again, we don't know if you're going to an autism clinic or you're going to that as opposed to a more community-based program. Did you go there because you were more severe? Um, the other thing, as best as I can tell from reviewing the DSM-4 website, um, when they did field testing in the community, which is, would alleviate some of my concerns about the milder kids, because this is American Psychiatric Association, the field testers were mental health professionals, right? So psychiatrists, therapists, they weren't pediatricians, developmental pediatricians, neurologists. And again, in my experience, the kids I send to the psychiatrists are the kids with the more severe issues. So my biggest concern is, are we not really testing for the milder kids? Um, a study just came out uh, that is so new I couldn't even pull it up to review the article where 
a, a reputable group looked at data on over 4,000 kids with a PDD diagnosis and looked at um, kids who had both parent questionnaires and also some clinical observation data, and they felt that most of the kids retained their diagnosis, which that's encouraging if that's true, because PDD is sort of the milder version of autism, but I can't give you any details because um, on PubMed, the only thing that's up is the abstract. There was no a study for me to review yet, so next time I'll have more data, and I hope that's true. I'm just not sure from a common sense perspective how that's happening. Um, the other thing that sort of bothered me along this process when we could have feedback to the process is one of the people who was involved in this process says, well, if we change these criteria, we'll nip the autism epidemic in the bud. Well, that's a fairly non-respectful um, comment that sort of precludes a respectful dialogue about these criteria. And to me, the analogy is it's like saying, well, we, we can stop the obesity epidemic. What we'll do is simply raise the, rate, the weight at which we call you obese, and then we won't have an obesity em epidemic anymore. So um, I think neither of those approaches eliminates the symptoms that people have. It just changes what we call you and makes it harder to get service. So we need to stay respectful in our discussions about these things so that we come out with criteria that are helpful to everybody, that achieve the goal of better diagnostic accuracy but don't sacrifice service because, again, the kids' late symptoms and challenges are not changing just what we're calling them, and we don't want to sacrifice service. So, you know, it's this, the criteria are going to be implemented, and we'll have to see what happens, and if it's not helpful, we'll have to have more discussion. Um, there is going to be a new... Um, label called social communication disorder, which is probably going to capture some of these kids who lose their autism label, looking at sort of more pragmatic language difficulties. Um, it would be nice if insurance will cover those labels and if you could get equivalent level of service for this disorder, so maybe that's the way we'll be able to get around it. Um, in terms of diagnosis in general, um, some people are still concerned about um, wanting to avoid the diagnosis. A lot of patients I see want to keep the developmental delay diagnosis as long as they can and not have their child labeled as autistic in the school um, setting. And there's a lot of fear of the diagnosis going on your permanent record. Like, I'm old enough to remember in school that that was the threat for your behavior. It's going to go on your permanent record and follow you the whole rest of your life. But I wouldn't really be afraid of that. If your child's in high school or college, nobody's going back to the elementary school records to look and see, did they have autism then? So if you have a fear that your label can't change, I, I would suggest not having that fear because labels do change and nobody's going back to check what your child has. And there are some benefits to having the label. So to me, the benefits, it really can help you getting the right school placement. Like my feeling in general about diagnosis and labels is use them where they help you and don't use them where they hurt you. So where they help you is getting the right school placement. Definitely can help you in getting more intensive services than if you just have a developmental delay label or a speech language delay label. Um, and I think it gives a common language for other people to understand the child's behavior. So if your child's tantruming, if someone knows they have autism, they're not going to say, well, that's just bad parenting they'll have a much better understanding, and that can help family, friends, um, better understand your child's behaviors. So what are the pitfalls? I think from a professional perspective is what I mentioned is that sometimes once you get a label, we stop thinking, right? And then everything that ever happens is just autism, and that's really not helpful either. So um, what I would suggest is that children with autism need thoughtful diagnostics about medical issues, about their behavior, about coexisting diagnosis, just like we would for any child who did not have autism. And we're going to talk about some of those things that get missed when we have that mindset. So if your child's constipated, someone needs to take that seriously as a medical issue, regardless of having autism. Yes, a lot of kids with autism are constipated, but it deserves a workup and treatment and not saying, well, all autistic kids are constipated, right? Um, in terms of who can diagnose autism, it has to be a physician, which is a pediatrician, a family practitioner, a neurologist, developmental pediatrician, or a psychologist. Your speech therapist, your OT, or your child's teacher may know your child's autistic, but it's out of their scope of practice. They can't really diagnose it. For some people, their diagnosis comes through the school system, and what a downside of that sometimes is that no physician is ever involved. You just get your diagnosis, go right into special ed and therapy, and when there's no physician involved, some things get missed. So if your child has never seen a physician, 
regarding the autism diagnosis, we're going to talk about some things to make sure it didn't get missed in terms of workup or referrals. Um, a lot of people complained to me that their primary care physicians didn't figure certain things out. And I really have to say, having been a primary care physician in my previous life, it's really hard to do developmental stuff when you have 40 kids with the flu throwing up in your waiting room and you have to move them through every 10 minutes. You really don't have time, even if you're interested. I mean, I do a two-hour history as the first part of my evaluation. There's no way you can do that and see 40 sick kids in the same day. It's just not possible. Um, so the time constraints limit you. And also, we're not doing a great job of educating physicians, so they don't actually have the knowledge base that they need um, to give you the service that you need. And so I, like you would do with any medical issue, your child has a complicated cardiac issue. They refer you to a cardiologist. They don't have time to do the whole workup. I would ask for a referral to a developmental pediatrician, to a neurologist with issues, with experience in autism, whoever's local in your area who's got experience. So I'm going to give you, again, clues so you know what not to let get missed. Um, one of the things that still happens in my practice is that um, not every kid has had a good hearing test um, because severe or profound hearing losses can mimic autism but can also coexist with autism. And those are often treatable problems. Right. Um, having a newborn screen that your child passed is not enough because you can acquire hearing loss, especially in the first three years. So you could be normal at birth and develop a hearing loss. So uh, many of the parents will say to me, well, I know my child hears. And you absolutely know your child's not deaf. You can ring a bell and your child responds. That's a 90 decibel sound. That's really loud. Right? You can clap your hands. These are all loud sounds. What we really want to know for autism is, is your child hearing at the frequencies at which speech is spoken? And that's a very narrow, softer uh, level of speech. And you cannot tell that without a hearing test. Right? So a lot of people will say, well, my child won't wear headphones. There's no way we're going to be able to test um, my child. I'm going to explain to you this test called um, Visual Reinforcement Audiometry, or VRA. Has anybody heard of that? Right. And it's a test that can be done as young as six months, because all it requires, developmentally six months. As long as your child can localize where a sound is coming from, they can do this test. Assuming they can stand being in the, the uh, soundproof room and they're not having a bad day, you know, but just developmentally they can do this test. So this is done in what's called a sound field, which is just a soundproof booth. And they have two speakers placed on either side of the child. And on top of the speakers, they'll have something very visually reinforcing. So it's often a bear that lights up and plays the drums. And what they'll first do is condition the child to look to one side or the other. So they'll start with making a sound come out of a speaker and at the very same time have the bear light up and play the drums so it's reinforcing. And then they'll do it on this side to make sure the child can figure out which side sounds are coming from. And then once the child's figured that out, they'll give the sound first. And when the child looks, then they'll reinforce with the bear that lights up. And they'll just keep lowering the sound so they can figure out at what sound level does the child stop looking. Right? So you can really know what decibel level a child is hearing. Um, it does not matter that we don't know which ear is hearing, because they're not wearing headphones, so they're using both ears to hear. But you, you don't need both ears to develop language. You could be completely deaf in one ear, and as long as one ear is working, you can develop language. So we don't need headphones for that. You need both ears to know where sound is coming from. So some of the kids who really don't hear in one ear might not be able to localize the sound. But as long as they can, it doesn't matter. So the reports will often say uh, hearing adequate in at least one ear for the development of speech. Right? So it's rare that kids need to be sedated for, more, um, for a different kind of hearing test. Almost everybody can pass this test with a good audiologist. So if your child has not had a hearing test beyond a newborn hearing screen. When kids come to my office, that's the first, second, and third thing I say is you need hearing, 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 because you don't want to miss that, because it's treatable in many cases. Okay. Um, my other um, thing that gets missed a lot is um, kids who are nonverbal. So my two least favorite comments that uh, parents have gotten told is he's not talking because he's autistic and therefore we don't have to think about it. Or my least favorite is she doesn't need speech therapy yet because she's not talking. Now, who needs speech therapy more than a kid who is not talking? So that makes me crazy. Uh, because the important distinction is talking and communicating are not the same thing. And everybody deserves a way to communicate, right? So nonverbal children need a way to communicate, or as you very well know, they're gonna communicate with their behavior. 
right? They need a way to communicate. Right? So the two things I think about when kids are nonverbal, and I think about this when I see a child who I think is cognitively high enough to be talking, and they're not talking. So autistic kids who are cognitively high enough or developmentally high enough to talk should be talking, and so why aren't they? Right? So the first thing I think about is can they hear? And the second thing is something called verbal apraxia. Anyone familiar with that? Okay, good number. This gets missed all the time. So I bet you there's some people in this room who have kids with apraxia and you don't know it. And it does change the kind of therapy your child needs, so I think it's important. Okay, so praxis means planned movement, and apraxia then means a problem with the planned movements of speech, right? So when you talk, you have to move your lips and your jaw and your palate and your tongue very rapidly to make sounds and words come out in an intelligible way. And the more I learn about apraxia, the more it amazes me that any of us can talk, right? Because when you talk, you have a thought, and in a split second, you've moved your mouth and your tongue and your jaw repeatedly in different places to make not just words, but paragraphs just flow out. It's truly miraculous, right? When you have apraxia, it does not flow. So you have the thought, and then you have no idea where to move your mouth to make the sound come out. And even a word as simple as mama, if you break it down, it's really complicated. Right? You have to move, close your jaw, move your lips together, force the mm sound out, and then as soon as you've done that, you have to drop your jaw down, make an ah come out, and then you've got to move everything back together again, make another mm, drop it back down again, make another ah, and that's just for mama. Well, what if you can't do that? Right? Um, so you're in ABA and your therapist is saying, say ball. Well, what if you can't say ball? You're not going to get very far in your therapy and your child's going to be really frustrated. Right. Okay. So what are the clues that this might be happening in your child? One is called sort of visible groping. If your child's really, you can see just struggling to try to figure out how do I make a word come out, right? You can really, some of the kids will just tense their whole body up. You can see it's a whole big process to get the right sound to come out. Um, Hard time putting an intelligible string of words together. Right? Um, this one is very common. How many of you have kids who've said a word once and then you're all excited and you say, he never said it again? Right? All right, so a significant number of people, right? So what happens is sometimes you're lucky and the stars align and in that brief moment of time, mama came out and then everybody's all excited and says, now do it again. Y you can't intentionally make it happen again. And the other thing that's common is you're much more able to say the word spontaneously when then someone puts demand on you because when there's demand anxiety comes in so not only is it hard but everybody's clapping and jumping around and saying say ball say ball and there's anxiety on top of the motor planning and forget it it's not happening so if you have a child who says a word and you don't hear it again i'd be really suspicious for apraxia um, kids who really have a very limited repertoire of consonant sounds, who say ba and da for everything, or can't make uh, very many vowel sounds, you have to wonder if it's motor planning. And the other thing I've noticed is sometimes these are the kids who, um, when they're looking at you, you think they might be looking at your eyes, but they're looking at your mouth, trying to figure out how did this person know how to make that sound. So kids who really look at your mouth when you're talking, I'd wonder about apraxia. So the reason this is important is you might need not just your average speech therapist, you might need someone who really has an expertise in apraxia because there's this very um, particular therapy called prompt therapy, which once I learned about this, I have kids who are now talking who I think would not be talking if they hadn't gotten this therapy. So prompt is just an acronym. It stands for prompts for restructuring oral motor phonetic targets. And what that big mouthful of words means is they're using a very multi-sensory approach to try to teach the child how to feel where the mouth needs to move. This is not like prompting an ABA where you're giving a visual cue or a verbal cue. This is hands-on. It's me sort of teaching you that motor memory of where your mouth's supposed to go. <coughs> I kind of think of it like a basketball player. The first time they shoot a jump shot, you know, you're thinking about bending your knees and extending your arms and follow through. But by the time you've done 100 jump shots, you're not thinking so much. It's automatic. I think once they get enough of this, how does it feel, it becomes more automatic. You'll find that they need the therapist to prompt them initially, then they'll figure out how to prompt themselves physically, and then they don't need the physical prompt. Um, and it's not usually available through school, though occasional school therapists are getting trained in it, so you almost always need private therapy, and you need to look for someone who is prompt trained or prompt certified. 
Um, there is, a, if you Google prompt, there's a website and can probably tell you who's trained in your area. The key thing about apraxia is um, treatment takes time. I definitely have um, kids who've lost their autism diagnosis before they've lost their apraxia diagnosis. So it's really important, since it's a long-term therapy, you have to have a way to communicate while you're learning how to speak verbally. So the other piece of this is to make sure you're getting an evaluation for other ways to communicate, sort of augmentative communication, which can be something as simple as the picture communication system, but can be more sophisticated like um, computer devices, and the iPad is huge right now for kids with autism. Right? Um, the voice output devices are also helpful because it lets the child hear the words coming back. Um, the, the benefits about the iPad, I think there are, there's great software. <clears throat> there's one called Touch Chat, there's one called Proloquo to Go. The graphics are great, the kids seem to intuitively know how to use it. Um, the disadvantages is that schools may not pay for it yet. I think this is a case of technology outpacing the law because the school can only buy you a device that's just for communication. They can't buy you a home computer. And you could use the iPad for a home computer, but even though it's you know, a tenth of the cost, they can't always buy it for you. Um, it's less sturdy than some of the other devices, so if your child's a thrower or a dropper, it may not be great, though Apple has come out with a case that's supposed to be able to survive a six-foot drop. So um, we're getting better at it. And the other thing I would say is if you um, are gonna be using an iPad for your child and you haven't used it yet, do not let them figure out there's YouTube on it because they are not gonna to wanna to use it for communication once they know there's fun stuff on it. So I would try to use it just for communication, let them use a different computer for YouTube. Now, Apple has gotten very clever and there are cases that can kind of block their ability to get on YouTube, but they're gonna know it's there. And it's just making your life a little harder. The other important thing, a lot of parents are concerned that if you give your child a device that will make them lazy or figure out they don't need to talk, talking is so much easier than using a device. So once kids can talk, they will not need to use the device and it will not keep them from learning how to talk. Uh, one of my speech therapists said, it'd be like if any of it, somebody came to any of us and said, you know what, you can only talk to me. You are not, no longer allowed to text me, email me, write me a note, gesture at me, send me, call me on the phone. We would never limit any of us to just speech, and yet we get really worried about giving the kids with autism any other way to communicate. They will talk, they really need a device or a, another system, or they're gonna withdraw or develop uh, problematic behaviors. Right. Um, the other thing is sometimes school systems will say, well, then we'll just do sign language for the kids with verbal apraxia. There's a subset of kids with the verbal motor planning problems who have problems with their hands with motor planning. And then so sign language is not a great choice if you don't know how to make signs either. And those are the kids who might do more for everything because it's easy, or they'll do this kind of signing, just they can't do the sophisticated uh, fine motor that they need for signing. So signing may not always be a good communication alternative for apraxic kids. So let's shift a little bit into some of the medical stuff that gets missed. Um, Many kids with autism will regress in the second year of life, so regression is not uncommon. But some regression is not just autism. So um, things that should make you think that maybe regression means something else in your child is if regression happened late, after two years, but especially if it happened after three, maybe some other reason besides quote unquote just autism made your child regress, or it's never normal to regress more than once. Now, I'm not talking about little dips you know, when you go on a supplement or you're focusing on one skill and you regress a little. But a true loss of language, for example, should not happen. It's never normal, but it certainly shouldn't happen more than once. If it happens multiple times, there's something else potentially going on that is potentially treatable. Um, if your child also regresses, loses skills when they're sick, when they're fasting, or if they get unusually sick with illness, unusually lethargic, unusual vomiting, even if it's not a GI, um, illness, those can be signs of metabolic disorders, and those are potentially treatable and need, need more of a workup. Um, so people who can work that up are your pediatrician if they're knowledgeable, neurologist, a genetic metabolic specialist. And if you have those things, you might ask for a referral. Say, you know, my child has multiple regressions. I think he needs more testing. Can you refer me? Um, because there are, sometimes these are pathways that are blocked and you either need to avoid certain foods that can't be metabolized well or you need certain nutrients to help unblock the traffic jams. So these are potentially treatable problems that can affect uh, child's development. 
Okay, so let's shift to talking about therapies. Again, there's a big synergy between these biomedical treatments that you're going to learn about and therapies. So my hope when I'm doing the functional medicine stuff is really to help the brain work better from the inside out. At a minimum, want to make the children more available to therapy. At a maximum, make the child not need the therapy, but you still need the therapy. Um, and it's really important to, to get a good evaluation to figure out what packet of therapies your child needs, not what his classmate needs, not what his next door neighbor needs. And it's also really important to reassess and adjust over time. It's very easy to get stuck on what you started with and not change, and sometimes the therapies need to change over time. So I want to talk a little bit about um, speech therapy. I think no matter how good your school district is, they are limited in terms of funding, number of speech therapists. I think it's really rare to get enough speech therapy from school alone. So if you can afford it, I would definitely recommend adding private speech therapy. Um, one of the things that happens at school because they're limited in therapists is they often will give your child group therapy. Um, and the rationale for that is, well, then he'll learn from the social milieu of being with other kids. Well, that's great if you're at a level of functioning where you actually notice the other kids. Right? Many of the kids are at lower level of functioning. They totally ignore the other kids. So if you have a 30-minute group therapy session, they're getting 10 minutes of therapy when someone's paying attention to them and they're stimming or not paying attention the other 20 minutes. So I really try to advocate for individual therapy. It's great if they also want to give group therapy, but I try to make sure you get some individual therapy from school. Um, augmentative communication, there's some nuances about this. Um, most school districts will have an augmentative communication team that could come assess your child, um, figure out what device works for your child, you know, what level of functioning are they at, what's the best match of software um, to your child. My big pet peeve is they'll often assess the child, give a device, and then have no therapy to help your child use it. So what happens is you get this great device and the teacher uses it to make choices for snack. You know, do you want juice or do you want milk? Or do you want this activity or that activity? And the real point of getting the device is to become a communicator. And someone needs to give you therapy to learn how to use your device to communicate. And that rarely happens at school. And sometimes you need to do that privately as well. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about occupational therapy. Um, as most of you know, most of your kids probably have sensory issues either being overreactive to certain things in the environment, whether it's sensitive to sound, to light, to touch, to smells, to busy environments, or it may need certain types of input, needing to move, needing deep pressure, needing to crawl under things, uh, needing to spin, needing to jump. And definitely, if these are significant, they can make you unavailable to learning and to therapy. So you can, there are two ways to help the situation. One is direct therapy, and the other is what we would call a sensory diet. Are you all familiar with that term? Not many. So we'll talk definitely about sensory diets. That gets missed a lot as well. So a sensory diet is really feeding the nervous system with the appropriate sensory input it needs to stay regulated. Okay. And to me, um, it's really important because your child needs more than that one hour of therapy. The sensory needs are not going to be resolved by one hour of therapy a week when they affect every day and every hour of your child's life. Okay. So it's critical to have what I would call a proactive sensory diet, not just reactive when problems develop. So commonly what happens at school is your child is fine and then starts having a sensory need, starts jumping and moving and not staying in the seat, and then they react to that and let the child walk in the hall or remove them from the learning situation and take them to another room to swing on a swing or sit on a therapy ball or dive in a ball pit, get the child re-regulated, come back. That works, but it's not ideal because you're being pulled out of the classroom and missing learning time. And also not being in the best regulated state to learn. So it makes much more sense to me to have what I would call a proactive sensory diet, which means giving your child sensory input throughout the day, even if they look fine. So to me, it's directly analogous to eating. Like, you do not wait every day, skip breakfast, hopefully. You don't skip breakfast and wait till your blood sugar has dropped and you're really cranky and then go, oh, I should have eaten something, right? And then you go get food and you feel better. You figure out pretty quickly, if I eat food at 8 o'clock, I'm no longer cranky at 11 o'clock and I don't have to go find food and I'm not mean to everybody. 
right? So the same thing with kids. If you figure out every day your child is dysregulating at 10 o'clock and needing a certain kind of input, then it makes a lot more sense. Even if he looks great at 9 o'clock when he gets to class, give him the input first, and hopefully he'll stay regulated and not need to stop what he's doing to go get re-regulated. And you often have to ask for this and get it put in the IEP, which is I want him to have a certain kind of input at 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 1 o'clock, whatever, and um, an OT can write you a plan for a sensory diet. Right? And I would get it in the IEP because even the best intentioned people, if they get busy, aren't going to do it unless there's a way to hold them accountable. The other thing, way to make sure this gets done is you have to make it doable. I mean, school systems are limited in number of people in the classroom, number of therapists available. If your plan is, I need you to take them out of the classroom every two hours, that really may not be realistic. So you have to think of things that would be hard for them to say no to. Right? So, uh, for example, I have a little girl who got uh, referred to me. They thought she had ADHD because she spent the whole day with her foot, feet up on the edge of her desk, pressing really hard into the desk and pulling her shoelaces so hard she broke her shoelaces. Right? And they said, she's ADD, she's got her feet up on the desk, she's fidgeting. She was really seeking what we call proprioceptive input, which is deep pressure to the base of her foot. That organized her and she could pay attention. But it was distracting to the other kids that she had her feet up on the desk and it bothered the teacher. What we figured out with a good OT evaluation is that's the input she was seeking. And we did two things. One is before she goes to school, rain or shine, she goes in her backyard and she jumps on her trampoline for 15 minutes and pounds her feet into a trampoline. So she arrives at school with a lot of that input already in place and the school didn't have to do anything. And that, that buys her some time, but it doesn't get her through the day. So our creative OT said what she did in the school situation was she got those TheraBands, you know, those resistive bands that you can stretch to exercise your muscles. She tied that around the base of her desk legs. So now she can push her feet against the TheraBand and she gets exactly the right amount of pressure back to give her the input. Her shoes aren't up on the desk anymore. She's not breaking her shoelaces. It's not bothering anybody because her feet are under the desk and it took zero extra staff time, right? Because it's a TheraBand, it's there. No staff member has to take her out to go jump on a trampoline. She's pushing on the TheraBand. So there are ways that you can do these creative things that don't require extra staff. And how are they going to say no to a TheraBand around a desk? Why, why would you say no? It's helpful to everybody. The kids who are a little higher functioning, if they need sort of deep pressure to their shoulder girdle, you can teach them um, do push-ups against the wall for a few minutes. That doesn't take a lot of time. For the younger kids who like to carry heavy things, you can have them carry a heavy book across the classroom or put books on a book rack and you can say, can you help me? and move the book across the room. And you can, you know, act like you're a teacher who can't make up her mind. Two hours later, she said, you know, Tommy, can you move that back? Now, now you can get more proprioceptive input. In the afternoon, move it back over here. It doesn't require leaving the classroom. It gives them the proprioceptive input, and, and they're not going to say no to that. It's very doable, and it keeps the children regulated throughout the day. So I would make a big case for getting a proactive sensory diet in your child's IEP. And if the school can't provide you one, if you have a private OT, they can write you one, and then you can advocate for that to be put in the IEP. And you can do it at home as well. Um, the other things OTs will work at, I mentioned the motor apraxia, the motor planning problems. Those can affect the gross motor skills and fine motor skills. What we don't think about is that motor planning can also affect your ability to play. So some of the kids who look like they're having a social issue with not knowing how to play appropriately, you have to be able to motor plan to play. So playing or um, interacting requires ideation, which means coming up with the idea of what you want to do. Let's say you say, I want to move that train around the track. Then you have to be able to motor plan, putting the trains together, moving the trains around the track so they don't fall off, fall off the track. That's a motor planning issue. What if you can't motor plan? You may be really hesitant to join in that kind of play. And those might be the kids who kind of really don't join until they watched a bunch of kids do it. They've kind of figured out how they planned it, and then they'll try to join in. Uh, so an OT can help with that planning and execution part if motor planning is an issue. Uh, a number of your kids may also be low tone, kind of floppy. Um, that can affect endurance for sure. Um, also can affect posture. These are the kids who are going to kind of slouch, like to play lying down. Um, we don't think about if you don't have enough compensatory um, central strength to keep yourself sitting upright. It's also really hard to use your hands well because you're slouching and it, it affects your um, more distal 
control of your fingers, so it can affect your handwriting and other things if you're really low tone through here, and OTs can help with all of that. So there's a lot of bang for your buck to be gotten out of your OT if you know what to ask for. Um, there are a whole bunch of behavioral therapies, and I'm kind of going to go through sort of what I think um, are the challenges and the benefits of different therapies. It's clearly my opinion. Other people may have different opinions. But I think it's really important that you individualize and find the therapy that's best for your child, your family, and your philosophy. Because I always say I have a very easy job. I make a list of things for parents to do, and I go home. I don't have to do a single thing on that list. Right? So I could say do ABA. You've got to set up an ABA team and coordinate it. Or floor time could tell you to do a bunch of sessions a day. You have to pick something that's doable. If you have two working parents, you have multiple children, you have financial limitations, you know, not all these therapies work for everybody. And you really have to individualize not only the therapy, but how it fits into your life and also into your philosophy. Not every therapy is a good match for each family. And then I think, again, really important, you need to adjust um, the therapies over time. I think it's really easy once you get into ABA, for example, which I think is really helpful, to never want to give it up, right? It's very structured, you have people doing it, you get good data, but sometimes your child may outgrow it and need a different kind of therapy and you have to be willing to reassess and give it up, and that's hard to do. So the behavior therapies I'm going to run through, you're probably familiar with many of these, ABA, which is applied behavior analysis, VB, which is verbal behavior, floor time, which they've now renamed into a big mouthful uh, called DIR, which is developmental individual difference relationship-based therapy. I think floor time was much easier <laughs> to say. And it's also now confusing because we all like little acronyms. That's easily confused with DIR with RDI, <laughs> which is relationship development intervention. And then sort of a little newer on the scene, um, Social Thinking by Michelle Garcia Winner. We'll talk about all these things. Okay. So ABA used to be referred to as LOVAS by the name of the psychologist who uh, developed it. And it's really a very behavior-based um, therapy where you observe behaviors, you positively reinforce them, and you're trying to shape the positive behavior. Um, the other names you'll see it called are discrete trial training, or pivotal response training, and then there's also verbal behavior, which really focuses a little more on the verbal aspects. I think there are absolute uh, good benefits of ABA. It's often, for the lower functioning kids, a really good place to start, because I think it really teaches kids how to learn, how to sit, how to attend to another human being, how to respond to um, reinforcers. It's, I think it's often a good place to start. Really good for teaching specific skills, increasing a knowledge base. Uh, for the ch child, really good for specific behaviors, whether it's toilet training, whether it's tantruming, really good at analyzing what's the function of the behavior, right? So if your kid's tantruming, for example, why is that? You know, it could be that they are frustrated because they don't have language. It could be that they figured out if they tantrum, they get out of a task, right? You have to figure out what's the purpose of the behavior, and then you can shape it back to the more desired behavior. Um, it's generally pretty easy to find ABA therapists. And some insurances are starting to cover it, thankfully. And again, especially if you're in the military and have TRICARE, you can get up to $3,000 for a month for ABA, which is amazing. So the challenges to ABA, I think any of you who are doing it, you know it is a full-time job if you're running a home program. Right? You have to organize the therapist, you have to train them, you have to maintain them. They're often college students, so they turn over. Right? And so it is a full-time job if you're not going to a clinic that does all this for you. Um, if you don't have insurance, it's expensive. Um, and I do think as kids develop more skills, I think sometimes it's hard for them to generalize to less rote settings where things aren't asked in the same way. So I might see kids who I say, how are you? And they say seven years old. And I said, well, they didn't quite hear that. You know, it's, sometimes it's a little too rote and you want to be able to generalize better. Or they've learned how to respond to how are you, but not how you doing. Right, so we want to, I think ABA is getting better and better about being more flexible about um, not just doing your therapy at a therapy table, generalizing it to more uh, naturalistic settings. But at some point, I think kids develop and need less rote behavioral-based therapy. Um, yep. So this, the next therapy is floor time. It was developed by the late psychiatrist, Dr. Stanley Greenspan, um, who really looks uh, non-behavioral 
project-based way that really this is more about how do you expand out a child's social interaction. So it's a lot on following the child's lead. So if your child is playing with a ball, how do you expand out that play with the ball? If they're just bouncing it, can you change it to rolling it back and forth? for example, and they use very, what's called high affect, which is a very lot of emotion to try to get the child to attend, uh, attend to you and have an interaction. Um, so it really is trying to work on what I think is the core deficits were the social deficits. So that I think that's the biggest ben benefit of it, that it really is looking on expanding that social and relationship skill. Um, the challenges, it requires a lot of parent time. So I always tell my parents, if you're doing floor time, leave your guilt meter at home when you go for your first assessment and you come out and they said you need to do eight 20-minute sessions a day on your own with your child of floor time down on the floor playing. That's impossible for almost anybody who has anything else to do in their life. So I would not feel guilty about it. I would learn the, the premises and the philosophy and the techniques and do as many sessions as you can. I think for a lot of these therapies, there's not a magic number. You know, ABA got a reputation of you need 40 hours. You know, that was based on an incredibly small study. And not everybody needs 40 hours of ABA. There's benefits to a lot of other experiences in life besides ABA therapy. Not everybody needs eight 20-minute sessions a day of floor time. So that's where you really have to individualize what makes sense and use some common sense about some of the number of therapy hours. One of my current uh, favorite therapies is RDI. Have people heard of this? Relationship Development Interaction. So a handful. So RDI was developed by a psychologist uh, by the name of Gutstein. And his premise is, okay, what really makes you have a happy life is not can you name 10 animals in a category or can you put something with the same, right? What makes you ultimately have a happy life is do you know how to be in relationship with other people? Right? So do you know how to be a son or a daughter? Do you know how to be a, a sibling? Do you know how to be a friend? Do you ultimately know how to be a partner or an employee? Right? These are all the important outcomes to have a happy life. Right? So their focus is how do you teach that? How do you teach relationship? So they have what they call this guided participation relationship where they sort of teach the parent to be the guide and the child is the apprentice learning from the parent, which is what happens naturally, but how do you make that more formalized? Right? And they're trying to teach what's called dynamic intelligence, which is what we all do without thinking. You have an experience, and it went well or it didn't go well, and you learn something from that experience, and the next time you're in a similar situation, you take that knowledge, you apply it, so you can have a different experience with the next situation. So how do you teach kids to adapt that the world is constantly changing? It's not rote. People don't ask things in the same way. They're not always predictable. How do you learn that in a very real context? So uh, there are several things I like about RDI. One is that it's focused on teaching parents, and it's not about having therapy done to the child. Um, it's also designed to kind of integrate the therapy into stuff you have to do in your daily activities anyway. So, for example, walking with somebody else is a relationship, right? If you have to take your child to the park and walk, if you're in relationship with somebody, you don't walk 10 feet ahead of them. You don't walk 10 feet behind them. You sort of pay attention to how they speed up or slow down, and you modulate your walking to walk with them. What if you have an RDI technique that's related to walking? You have to walk to the park anyway. It did not add any therapy time to your life, but you made that walking therapeutic. Right? I had a parent who, um, RDI does a lot on nonverbal, um, and you don't realize how much we talk to the kids until you observe yourself and realize how much you talk. Right? I had one kid who was playing in my office, and I was doing my usual, what color's the truck, and what's the name of the truck, and where's the train going, and he just looked at me and he said, stop the words. Right. He didn't say stop asking me questions, he said stop the words, which I think he felt battered by, I just want to move the truck. If you could stop asking me stuff, I could have a good play experience. Well, so RDI might do a lot of activities early on that tells you you have to play with your child for five minutes and not say a thing. That makes the child have to look at you, right, if they can't get the information verbally. So I had one mother who learned some techniques and she was in you know, a restaurant, a carry-out restaurant, waiting for her child's and her food to come. And her child said, where's the soda? And she normally would have just told him, but she'd done RDI. And so she didn't say anything because he wasn't looking at her. And eventually, he really wanted the answer, so he looked. And she normally would have then told him, but they were working on nonverbal. So instead of saying, it's over here, she just used her head and went and showed him with her body language, that's where the soda is. So she got eye contact, she got reading nonverbal cues in the five minutes they were waiting for carry-out food. Right? So it's a way to just kind of 
put it within your life, which makes it very doable. The other part of RDI is that you get um, homework assignments, which are to videotape whatever they're teaching you about, um, just a five-minute snippet. And then you get software so you can upload it to a server, and then you and the therapist can look at it together even if you're not in the same room. So you can do most of your appointments remotely, from work, from home, do a conference call, and everybody looks at the video, and they can point out, see how much you're talking in that video, or see when you did this, he did that. And so it's for people who are already in a lot of therapies, um, or um, you know, can't logistically get to one more therapy, or they're working, can't take time off work, you can do a lot of this therapy remotely. And it also lets you pick a therapist who may not be anywhere near you, this distance-wise, because you can do a lot of this uh, remotely. So I think it fits into parents' lives well. So at certain levels of functioning, I think RDI is a really helpful therapy. It may not be the first thing you do if your child doesn't even know how to be aware of another person. But this is one of the things when you've done our ABA for a while, maybe at some point you need to switch to some RDI. I'm also not a big either or person. A lot of people who do these therapies say you need to only do ABA or only do RDI. And at some point, I think kids can mix and match some of these things. They figure out what they do with different therapists and their complementary treatments. So the challenge of RDI is there's not as many trained therapists yet in RDI. And also, if they're not a mental health provider providing the therapy, it's hard to bill for it. So it's hard to get insurance coverage. Um, social thinking is um, a social skills um, development therapy developed by a speech pathologist named Michelle Garcia Winner. And I have to say, all my colleagues who are social skills people are just ecstatic about her approach. Um, she's really trying to, I think, take advantage of the kids' good cognitive skills to teach them how to think socially, like how their own social minds work, <clears throat> why do people respond the way they do, how does your behavior affect someone else, how do behaviors affect emotions. Um, she has several different models. One acronym she has is called the I Laugh model, where you really break down all these skills and how do you teach these things that, that most of us took for granted. How do you learn how to initiate language with somebody. You, know, you can't just walk into a room and start talking. You have to make some connection with the person so they know you're talking to them. How do you use eye contact? One of the good examples, um, I'll give you in a second, is uh, how she differentiates teaching eye contact different from ABA. When she teaches, how do you abstract? How do you inference? How do you understand perspective? How do you get the big picture? Right? What's humor? All these things that are the more sophisticated things that really make, give life its richness. How do you teach kids that? So, for example, with eye contact, a more typical behavioral model would be, would be you tell somebody, eyes on me, or make good eye contact. Well, many kids will do that and have no idea why they needed to do that. And you'll notice some of the kids will look at your ear or look at your nose, but they seem to know that people seem happy if you look somewhere in the general vicinity of their face, but they don't know why they're doing it. So she will say, instead of, look at me, she'll say, think with your eyes. That's a completely different concept, right? Because when you look at somebody, you're not just looking at them to have a conversation, you're learning a lot about what they're thinking and what's expected of you. So, if, for example, if a teacher is teaching um, in the classroom and she's you know, reading a story to the class, you can look at her and get an idea of what she's thinking and feeling, but if she is looking at somebody else when she asks a question, you can learn with your eyes that she did not mean for you to call out the answer because she was not looking at you, right? So there's a lot more to learn from using your eyes than just eyes on me. So there's those kind of shifts in how they're teaching skills. I think for the kids who have enough cognitive skills to use those, uh, to understand that, it's been really helpful. So the benefits are it builds you a very solid foundation of how to think socially. It utilizes the child's cognitive strengths, and I think you can generalize it better. Um, right now, it's mostly designed for the higher functioning kids, the older kids, though she is starting to now do seminars for younger kids. Um, so I want to talk a little bit, shift gears again, talk about um, vision testing. Um, any of you heard about developmental optometry? Right, this was a new one on me as a very traditional person in my previous life, um, that I really only knew about ophthalmologists who really look at eye health and eye pathology and whether you can see 2020 or not. Developmental optometrists um, look at how your eyes function, right? So to me, it's like what you're learning here today about functional medicine, how are your kids' bodies not functioning in terms of their biochemistry. Developmental optometrists will look at how are the eyes working? How are they functioning? 
right? And so vision therapy is available. It's not the only treatment for learning, but it may be an important piece for some of these kids. Right? So problems you can have with your vision, poor tracking, not being able to follow a target, poor eye contact, poor convergence, which means kind of making your eyes a little cross-eyed when you have to look at something on a piece of paper. Um, trouble maintaining focus or shifting focus. So can you focus on words and then shift your focus to, this, to the blackboard or the whiteboard? And shift your eyes back and forth. Can you do that well? Um, some kids have double vision um, or other visual processing or visual spatial issues. So what are the clues that can tell you maybe your child needs to see a developmental optometrist? Um, problems with reading, particularly if kids skip words or skip lines. Reversing letters can sometimes be developmental, so it's not always a great clue. But if kids lose their place or need to follow the words with their finger to not lose their place, some of the verbal kids will say the words look like they're moving, which means you can't keep them in good focus. Um, or if they're overwhelmed by there's just too much visual information on the page. <clears throat> kids who have lazy eye, it's called strabismus, if their eyes drift in or drift out. Um, if your kid, child has an unusual posture, tilts their head when they're trying to read, um, holds things too close or too far. Or another clue is if they tend to close an eye or cover an eye, that can be a clue for double vision because the way to make double vision stop is to close one of your eyes. Right? Um, or kids who are clumsy don't know where their body is in space. Um, the reason I think it's important to look is that your visual system is important for your whole day. And I have a lot of kids, to my surprise, who when they got um, vision therapy, um, their anxiety levels went way down. And I really did not expect to see that. But I guess it makes some sense. If you don't know where your body is in space and you can't gauge things, that you could be pretty anxious. Not everybody needs this, but um, be something worth talking about. If you have a developmental pediatrician or someone working with you, or your OT, do they think there are visual issues beyond what can be addressed in OT? Um, neuropsych testing, I uh, just want to talk about briefly. This is really more comprehensive testing than schools will do. It's very detailed educational, cognitive testing, psychological testing. Um, it's really expensive. I mean, it can be several thousand dollars to do and often not covered by insurance. So the question is, when does it make sense to do it? Um, I recommend neuropsych testing when I really have a diagnostic issue. I don't really know what's going on with the child. I need someone to really delve in very um, deeply about the diagnosis. Or if you're really not getting um, enough supports at school, neuropsychologists are great at making really detailed recommendations about supports for education. Um, or if a child really loses cognitive skills, I might uh, think about testing. Because it's expensive, I have to think you have to think about when you get the best bang for your buck out of doing it. The two times I think about it um, before third grade is sometimes a helpful thing because third grade becomes a time when a lot of uh, things that are difficult for autistic kids become important, which is inferencing and abstracting. So it's no longer when you read a book, you know, who went to the store. It's why did they go to the store? Right, and that becomes really hard. And so there may be more supports that could be written into your child's IEP. But not everybody needs neuropsych testing at third grade. Don't misinterpret um, that I'm recommending that. But if you're thinking there are a lot of needs, this is one time they might show up. It's before third grade. And then another time that kids tend to sort of fall apart is before entry, entry into middle school, where they might have enough cognitive skills to hold it together when they're in one class and things are organized for them, and then middle school requires multiple class changes and long-term projects and group interactions. And so if that's an area of significant difficulty for your child, getting tested so that when you enter middle school, you have a really good uh, supportive plan in place is another time to think about it. And then periodically, you need to reevaluate because you might need to change your treatment plan. Um, in the remaining minutes, I'm just going to try to zip through um, some practical challenges that come up, especially if you don't have someone guiding you. Um, ideally, it'd be nice to have a developmental pediatrician or somebody being your case manager to make sure you haven't missed things in the medical workup, to help guide your supplements and your medication, to advise you on school and therapy, to help coordinate. But sometimes that's not possible. I mean, there may not be an appropriate clinician where you live, right? They may cost more than you can afford. Their waiting list may be too long. Um, and oftentimes, physicians don't want to do this because they don't get paid well for case management. Right? It's just not realistic. So if you have to be your own case manager, I'm going to give you what I sort of think may be some helpful 
advice about that. Um, I would seek out the best available clinicians you have in your area, and I think other parents are going to be your best resource. So contact the local autism society to see who parents are saying is um, easy to work with, and knowledgeable. Um, therapists can also be helpful, other parents. Okay. Um, I think you don't need to have your traditional doctors believe in what they perceive to be alternative treatments. But I think what you want to look for is clinicians who are open-minded and who are willing to listen. And what I really want from my partners in the traditional world is that they can at least advise me whether they think a treatment is harmful. Right. So if I might want to know from a neurologist, this child has a seizure disorder. I know you don't think this supplement will help. Here's how it works. Do you think it will harm? So you want somebody who at least might be willing to answer those questions. And if you frame your question in a way that says, I'm asking this because of safety, you know, physicians want to do no harm. So they might be more willing to give an answer if that's how you frame it. I have a neurology colleague who definitely does not believe in any supplements. In fact, all his emails to me when I ask him something start with, as you know, I don't believe in supplements, however. <laughs> but we have a relationship, and after however, he answers my question about safety, right? So I'm okay that he doesn't believe because he's, he's a partner in what I need him to be a partner with. So just to run quickly through some sample situations you might come up uh, against and give you some advice if you don't have anybody guiding you. So if your child has a seizure disorder um, and you wonder, if, or let's put it this way, if you wonder if your child might have seizures and you're in the process of getting that evaluated, um, there are certain supplements that you're going to hear about here that nicely have anti-seizure benefit, like magnesium, like GABA, like taurine. But I would suggest if you're going to get worked up for seizures, don't start those supplements until you get the EEG done because you don't want to mask, mask the seizures and, and mess up the diagnosis. Um, and if your child already has seizures, I think your neurologist needs to know if your child's going on psychiatric medicines or certain supplements because they really might be contraindicated. For example, there's a supplement, phosphatidylcholine, that raises a neurotransmitter acetylcholine, and some neurologists feel that worsens seizures. So I think it's important for people to um, all be communicating with each other. Um, if your child's on psychiatric medicine, there are a couple things you need to know it will interfere. So if your child's on an SSRI like Prozac or Zoloft or um, Celexa, um, you do not want to add a supplement called 5-HTP because that makes serotonin. So then you'll have to, a medication and a supplement both making serotonin transmitter in your brain and that can be very dangerous. So you don't want to put both of those together. There's occasional situations where you might want both on board, but both prescribing people need to be talking to each other to make sure you're not getting too much. If your child's on stimulants like uh, Vyvanse or Ritalin, you want to be careful about a an amino acid tyrosine because it also raises the same transmitter that the stimulants are raising. So it's, again, best to make sure people are talking to each other. The psychiatrist needs to know what supplements you're taking, because sometimes you may need less medicine. I mean, that's the whole goal of some of the supplements we give, is that some of these supplements make the medicines more effective, or they're treating things that we thought needed medicine, but weren't really medicine issues, and you might need lower doses of medication. So people just need to communicate. Okay. Um, if your child has sleep issues, um, I'd be careful not to give medicines and supplements that are both sedating. So again, coordination is important. And holistic pharmacists will often know what will interfere with each other, so they can be good resources. Um, if your child has reflux or GI symptoms, which are really common, we talk a lot at this conference about digestive enzymes. I'd make sure your GI doctor doesn't think there's a reason that would be harmful. The main contraindication is ulcers, which is really unusual in a child as opposed to an adult, but it's always worth asking your GI. And many of your kids may be on Miralax for constipation, which is not necessarily a bad thing in certain situations, but there are many supplements that we talk about here that have laxative effects, like magnesium, like vitamin C, and you might then be able to cut down on your Miralax dose, so again, one hand needs to know what the other one's doing. Just in general, I'd suggest, as someone who's on the receiving end of uh, information, it's really helpful if you get copies of all your child's lab tests as they happen. It's often hard to get them later. Um, get copies of test results. Most of us do not need to see the actual MRI or the actual EEG, but it's nice to see a report, it's, especially if there's an abnormality. Nice to see what the written report is. Um, get copies of your evaluations by your specialists. It's often helpful for us to look at those. And get them soon after they happen. If you have to go through the hospital medical records department, that can take forever. Um, 
and it's best, best to bring those copies with you. I know for me, if I get the reports at the time of the initial evaluation, it really helps me to put it in context while I'm trying to decide what's going on. And three weeks later when they come, I mean, I have as much time to look at them as I'll have when I first see you. Um, therapists can also be good resources for you um, for advice as long as it's within their scope of practice. So for example, your OT might be able to detect if your child has vision issues and might be able to do the therapy and you might not need vision therapy if they can incorporate some of those therapies. Um, I would, for speech therapy, if you think your child's apraxic, look for a prompt trained therapist. For OT, we talked about being very proactive about the sensory diet. And really most importantly, get as much information as you can from people you trust so you can make informed choices. And then really you know your child better than anybody else. You get all this information, then you have to trust your instincts. I'm going to quickly end just with a success story about a little boy named Matt who gave me permission to talk about him. Um, he's now 14. Um, when I saw him, he was probably my most severe patient in my practice. Severely autistic, severely apraxic, could not make a sound to save his life has severe sensory issues. Um, and he is now recovered. And I would say why he recovered was he had excellent special ed, excellent speech pathologist who did prompt therapy with him for his dyspraxia. And he had, at that time, we weren't sophisticated, so we just had picture communication symbols, no iPads. He had excellent OT, intensive biomedical treatments with me, dietary change, supplements. Had an amazing mother who did everything at home that she was asked to do. And now that I know Matt, he was really determined to talk. Um, by six, he was not autistic anymore, but it took till nine till his apraxy was better. And one of the first things he said to his mother was, thank you for always believing I could talk. I'm sure that made all the therapy worth it. Um, he, he's uh, very into old movies. And uh, one of the things autistic kids can't do very well is inference and compare and contrast. And he was in my office one day and he just kind of said, you know what I figured out? I figured out Tom Cruise is no John Wayne and Nicole Kidman is no Katherine Hepburn. <laughs> and I said, I think you're cured. <laughs> um, um, he's now 14, he's bright, he writes poetry, he's into drama, he's in a regular gifted, he's in gifted and talented classes. Um, but one day he folded his now six foot tall frame onto my couch and he said, Dr. Compart, do you remember when I couldn't talk? And I said, I remember that. What do you remember? And he said, I'll tell you the four bad things and the 101 good things I learned from the experience. I don't think I could come up with 101 good things from a, a bad experience. But of course, you know, people want to know what are the things he said. Right, so his bad things were, you know, he had, he was very frustrated by not being able to communicate. He has what he calls hissy fits when he couldn't communicate. But I couldn't hear all the 101 good things, so I asked for top five. And he said, um, it started his friendship with me. It started his friendship with a speech therapist. He, he got closer to his family. He actually loved that a team of people had to help him. And then he smiled and he said, and donuts. And so I looked at his mother, I said, donuts? And she said it was the first word he said. So for a year, he got reinforced with donuts for everything he ever said. So he clearly has a sense of humor. He is a wonderful kid. He's very spiritual and religious. We talk about God from this kid who had no language. Um, he advises me about parents who are struggling, what to tell them. He's an amazing human being. So amazing, I forget. He can be 14 and have adolescent issues because I have him up on such a pedestal because he's just remarkable. Um, so he's why we all have these conferences, why we do what we do. We want that outcome. So to get your best outcome, I would say educate yourself about all the aspects of your child's diagnosis. Don't be afraid to ask questions about referrals, about therapies, about treatments. Get yourself to the right physicians and the right therapists. Um, continually reevaluate so you can adapt and change the program as you go along. And I would say have hope. We get, we get um, those of us who do this work who think we can make the kids have better quality lives get a, accused of giving parents false hope. And I would say what I would call myself is a realistic optimist, which is I'm not God. I really don't know what the outcome's gonna be but I know enough of these kids can get better enough to have better quality of life. So I'm gonna be optimistic till proven I shouldn't be, and that's my realistic optimism. And I would submit that realistic optimism is not giving people false hope. Thank you.
The Autism Research Institute relies on the generosity of donors like you to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you.